This is Micah Clark, the director of the American Family Association of Indiana. We're doing a podcast today. I know it's been a while since we've done one. We're trying to get back into practice of that because I know many people are interested in podcasts. It's something we want to do more of in 2022. So to kind of jumpstart this, I'm starting with a friend I've had for many years. David Lance is a local Indianapolis author. He's also a teacher and professor. I first met David when he was the head of the Indiana Christian Coalition in the 1990s. We've been friends for many years. David has a new book out. He's been working for a long time as a professor and a teacher. He is a student of culture, in particular, how culture impacts young people. So he has this book that he's written to target to young people. It's a novel. It's an entertaining book. And it's called The Chronicles of Belteshazzar. And before I ask the perfunctory question you usually ask an author, why did you write this book? Let's start off from the very basic. What is Belteshazzar? Who is Belteshazzar? It's a name we don't hear very often. And there's a funny thing in the book where the person can't pronounce the name. But explain to us <laughs> who Belteshazzar is, because I think people know who he is. They just may not know this name. Sure. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, one of the characters, uh, 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 it starts out with a grandson uh, by the name of Isaiah Pierce, who's talking to this girl. Her name is Mary. And she says, belt a shoe carnival <laughs> and so can't quite get uh, the concept belteshazzar is the babylonian name that the babylonians gave to daniel uh, when he and his friends went to uh, babylon i'm not 100 percent sure but i think it means that may marduk protect him marduk was the chief god of the babylonians let me show the book cover um i worked with a, a young lady by the name of shelly savoy uh, and uh, so she found some um, uh, free pictures. Uh, this is 16th century art. It's actually a picture of King David uh, uh, and, and so forth, putting together uh, the cover there. But it's the idea that uh, will Daniel live by faith or will he cower in fear? And uh, the same question for us. Well, David, I know we've interviewed on, you on books about civics, about government, politics. What led you to write this novel? Well, I am a grandfather myself. I have four grandchildren. My oldest grandson, Isaac, is 10. My youngest, Aiden, is two. And uh, my son and his family, they live in South Korea. Uh, so I have to contact via Zoom, things of that nature. And I wanted to, to do something that I could basically be involved in the lives of my grandchildren, particularly my oldest one. And so you might know I wrote a novel a long time ago called The Brotherhood of the Scroll. What I did was I grabbed parts about Daniel out of that novel, and then I blended it with the concept of a movie called The Princess Bride. That's where a grandfather comes to visit a grandson who's homesick in bed, reads a, a story to the grandson, and the characters come alive. And in my story, the grandchildren come and visit uh, the grandparents. Grandpa sort of dresses up uh, and then does the story of Daniel. Uh, and and I wanted to use this as a vehicle to b talk about God and moral values with my own grandchildren. And I think that a lot of grandparents and parents will have an interest in doing the same with their kids. You know, David, I hear a lot of people talk about Daniel from time to time throughout the years in regards to, in particular, government, because a lot of people forget that there is a lot about Daniel that is involved in government action. Of course, mm -hmm. certainly in this instance, he's a slave, a, a captive, but he works in government. And sometimes we hear the phrase separation of church and state, but we don't find that in the Bible. There are many characters who were involved in government in, in the Bible, both by choice and in Daniel's case, and you could say in Joseph's case maybe as well, not by choice, but they thrive there and, and they, they stand for the Lord there. So you get into this a little bit in your book about separation of church and state. How did that come about and, and how do you connect it to the story in the Chronicles of Belshazzar? Well, thank you. I, I needed a way, to obviously, to start the novel because it begins in modern 21st century America. Uh, and um, the aunt, uh, Aunt Sarah, is babysitting her grandchildren. And uh, the oldest, Isaiah, has a problem. Uh, I picture Isaiah to be about 12. He's in middle school. He's outside. He's reading his Gideon Bible. And a girl comes, grabs the Bible from him. He chases after her. She tosses it in the bushes as he gets close, and she yells, separation of church and state. And Isaiah's question is, did I do something wrong? Well, Aunt Sarah then says, well, you know, your grandpa used to read stories about all sorts of Bible characters, and one was about Daniel and how he was 
thrown to the lions because he prayed to God and that was against the law. You should ask your grandfather. And so it starts from there. And I weave in a little bit of the story of that phrase, separation of church and state. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with the fact that that was that came from a letter that Thomas Jefferson as president wrote to the uh, Association of the Danbury Baptists of Connecticut. What most people I find don't know is what it was the Baptists wrote President Jefferson. Their concern was since the Declaration of Independence says that our rights come from God, including the right of religion, then what the heck were you politicians doing by putting the right of religion in the First Amendment? Because any right that a man gives to people can be taken away by other men at some point in the future. And, and so I even had a conversation with a young uh, lady by the name of Nadia, who is a really good friend of our family, and she read the drafts of this. And we talked about this, and I sent her a video of a person reading through the letters between the Danbury Baptist and Thomas Jefferson. And it turns out <laughs> the video I chose was put together by an Iranian guy, and he's commenting on the letters in Farsi. And, and I am just fascinated. I went to his YouTube channel and discovered he'd done all sorts of videos on the Federalist Papers. And I thought, what's this Iranian guy doing with discussions and explanations of the founding documents of the American system of government? I've never been able to con contact the guy yet, but I'd love to find out what led him to do that. So, David, as you weave this into the book, you know, you and I have both worked with a lot of homeschool co-ops, taught high school students on worldview classes and for you government and some other classes. Is this a worldview, does, does worldview, is, is there a worldview lesson in this book? Is that something you tried to teach to kids? Very much so. Um, I imagine um, if you look in uh, chapter two of the book of Daniel, then you'll see that the, the captain of the Babylonian guard is told by Nebuchadnezzar to go find all the wise men and kill them because among other uh, uh, people, Daniel is not present when the king, when King Nebuchadnezzar is asking people to tell him what the dream is. So the, the Babylonian uh, captain of the guard finds Daniel and Daniel has a conversation with him. And instead of killing Daniel, he takes Daniel and he talks to the king. Now, I believe that such a conversation would not have happened unless the captain of the Babylonian guard and Daniel somehow had gotten to know each other. Why would this Babylonian guy pay any attention to a foreigner unless they'd already met and become friends? So I imagine a scenario where a Jewish guy is beating up on a man from Ashkelon. The Ashkelonites were Philistines and deadly enemies of the Hebrews. Daniel comes to the rescue, not of the Hebrew man, but of the Ashkelonite. The captain of the Babylonian guard, whom in my book is called Naaman, sees this, talks to Daniel, they have a conversation, and they end up talking about their respective flood stories. Now, Micah, here's a, 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 a pop quiz question. Have you ever heard what the story of the tales of Gilgamesh are when um, essentially Unapishtum the Babylonian equivalent of Noah lands his boat. Have you ever heard that story? No, and I probably can't even spell the names in it. I can't. I can't spell them, but I can tell you the story. <laughs> so Unapishtum, who only had seven days of a flood instead of forty, lands his boat, sacrifices to the gods, and the gods descend like flies on the sacrifice to consume the, the, the meal. Why? Because for seven days, man is not sacrificed to them and they're starving. And so the gods promise never to destroy man again. Why? Because they need mankind to feed them. Now, in the Babylonian mindset, as, as my cat uh, walks behind me here, his name is Zeke, uh, short for Ezekiel. Uh, so in the Babylonian mindset, the, the gods require mankind to be servants or slaves. And therefore, they treat mankind as worthless. The Babylonian mindset is to treat everybody as worthless. But God, the moral God of Christianity, is active in human nature on behalf of his people. And so Daniel says to the captain of the Babylonian guard that our God wants to build a relationship with people, not to have might versus right, but to be in relationship with people and to find win-win solutions. And so... 
in the in the in the novel, Naaman comes to realize that Daniel t- thinks totally differently than the Babylonians, and in that way, I bring this difference between worldview and how it plays out in relationships into focus for the reader. It sounds like you're touching on, on trying to instruct kids in critical thinking skills too. Is that is that part of your objective? Oh, very much so. I you know, know you've run into that as a professor. Yes. Um, I, I have to tell you, uh, if you think about it, it says in the Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident. Micah, I have literally had a senior in high school come up to me and say, what do the words self-evident mean? Hmm. Now think about this. Generation Z does not believe in absolute truth. So how can you hold these truths to be self-evident when your generation doesn't even think that real truth exists. And so you have to have all sorts of conversations. And so what the grandfather does in this storyline is to answer questions from the kids, just like in The Princess Bride, uh, the grandfather played by Peter Falk answers questions from his grandson. And and so you pop in and out of the story of Daniel into the real world to, to see how all this works out. And so I try to use real cultural things uh, and so forth. Here's here's one example. Have you ever watched the movie The Three Mus of the any version of the movie The Three Musketeers? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yes. if you watched it, I've not read the book by Andrew Dumas, but essentially you got the Carl Richelieu, who is a Catholic priest, and you've got King Louis the Thirteenth. Both groups have soldiers. Both groups have you know the 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 musketeers are blue and and they represent the king the bad guys wear red and they represent the cardinal well in my novel i take that idea and i i posit a chief priest of the babylonians who wants to basically dethrone overthrow nebuchadnezzar and so they compete with each other and so think of a deep state in the government there that wants to get rid of nebuchadnezzar and there's this one guy his name is daniel and he stands in your way now what do people in ancient times do to people that stand in their way? They try to kill them. Mm-hmm. And so there launches into a separate whole part of the of the subplots of the novel, which I think makes sense given the context of this of the biblical story. So it's a historical adventure in many ways. But tell me, you've got a strange title for one of your chapters. It's called Governor Thermostats and Governors. What is that chapter about? Well, uh, you know, at one point, uh, one of the grandchildren stops grandpa and says, you know, I get it, grandpa. They had lots of idols and different gods way back then. And and we don't have that anymore. But we do have lots of politicians who are all trying to tell us what to do. Right. And grandpa says, right, let's go down the hall. And so they go to the thermostat. And and uh, uh, grandpa says to Isaiah, his grandson, have you ever thought about how the thermostat controls the temperature in the house? And I say, I say as well, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me, Grandpa. And so, well, there's this thing called a governor. Now, what's the top politician of a state called? It's called a governor. And so politicians, governors controlling the thermostat, uh, as well as how the Holy Spirit of God controls our heart to try to help us stay within the boundaries of Christian principles. We don't always do that. Sometimes the furnace or the air conditioner in the house breaks down. But this concept of thermostats controlled by governors is a way that I use in that chapter to explain the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, David, I want to thank you for writing Governors and thermostats. (laughs) (laughs) I want to thank you for writing this book. It's, It's important for us to reach the younger generation with entertaining stories that have a worldview in it. You know, I have a friend who is a filmmaker, and he said, every Every film is somebody's sermon, and really every book is that way too. It's somebody's worldview uh, conveying to, some, to their audience. And I want to thank you for your your efforts here. Tell, tell our audience how they can get your book and uh, how it would be a good Christmas gift maybe from you know, your, sure. your book. And grandparents reading the grandkids, they could read this book to them as well. Uh, so tell me about how, how to get your book. What's the best way to do that? Uh, The best way, frankly, is to go to Amazon.com. You just simply type in, you know, you go to books and type in Chronicles of Belteshazzar. Uh, Probably the first thing when you type in Chronicles, it'll pull up Chronicles of Narnia. At least it does for me. Mm -hmm. But Chronicles of Belteshazzar, it's in Kindle format. It's in paperback. 
and I've also put it together in hardback. And so the reason I did it in hardback, and you can get either of those three versions on Amazon, uh, but you can go to your local library. I don't care if it's a Christian school library, uh, the public library, uh, uh, whatever, and you can ask them to order it. Most libraries prefer a hard copy because after a certain number of times, the book begins to wear out if it's a paperback. So you can go, and the ISBN number is really important. The, there's a 13-digit number, and I'll just tell you for the hardback, the last four digit, the last three digits are 417. So you just find the hardback version. You go to your library and say, hey, uh, could you please think about ordering it? Or you can do like my mother, and you could buy the hardback copy and then gift it to the local library. Mm -hmm. um, either way works great. And, and I see a, a real need to get this sort of thing into the libraries. You know, uh, you and I have been involved with Purple for Parents and, and all the stupidity that's happening in terms of pornography in the libraries. Wouldn't it be great to get a Bible-based uh, novel designed for 10-year-olds and up into the public schools? Or if you're a grandparent, like you said, it makes a great Christmas gift. Well, David, I want to thank you for joining us today. We're speaking with David Lance, the author of the new book, The Chronicles of Belteshazzar, which is a worldview book given in a novel form of a story about uh, Daniel and his captivity and uh, kind of an adventure story for kids ages 10 to, to, to adult. And so you can get that at Amazon.com, David Lance, L-A-N-T-Z. You can probably look it up by author as well. But mm -hmm. it's called The Chronicles of Belteshazzar. And David, thank you for joining with us. And I see your cat's loving on you. But uh, yeah, I Zeke says hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate all you're doing as well. So uh, thank, thank you for Michael. joining us today.